You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome to the latest episode of the Command Zone. I'm your host, Josh Lee Kwai. And I'm DJ. DJ is from the Jumbo Commander YouTube channel. If you haven't checked out his stuff, type Jumbo Commander into the YouTube search bar. He's going to pop up. Tons of deck techs. Awesome, cool stuff. It's a very exciting time of year, DJ. I am so excited. Uh, this is like, it's Commander Christmas. It's the best time of year. Oh, yeah. It really okay. is. So this deck has just been spoiled. And we are going to do this. Sorry, it's the Sahili, the blue red artifact commander deck from 2018. We got it. We got Planeswalkers we got as commanders. <laughs> oh, yeah. We finally got the artifact blue red artifact commander that we've been wanting. In fact, a few oh of them. Gosh. Yes. So it's, it's, it's literally like Christmas where you you open up your presents and it's like it's everything I ever wanted. I asked I asked Watsy Santa for this and I got it. And I got it. So we're going to be doing what we do every year, which is breaking down the pre-con deck, um, getting into the nitty gritty, the statistics, everything that we found out, uh, digging through it. But before we get into all of that, this deck, the other Commander 2018 decks, they're on cardkingdom.com slash command zone. You can pre-order right now. And listen, you're watching this show. You're probably going to buy some of this product or maybe all of it regardless. And just a quick reminder, we've got a promotion going on right now. Again, through that affiliate link with Card Kingdom, any sized order you place in the month of July, and you'll receive in the mail with your order a code, and that code will unlock the exclusive Game Nights logo background in our app, Lifelinker. It's the only way to unlock that background. And again, let me reiterate, it only applies to orders made in the month of July. So as of the time of this recording, you've got a couple of days left. Make sure to place an order of any size to get that code. And another big shout out for our other sponsor, Ultra Pro. You know, we're sitting here, we're looking at the beautiful Sahili playmats. There are Sahili deck boxes. There are Sahili sleeves. If you're going to build a deck around one of these new planeswalkers, we are going to want to really theme all of our stuff around it, right? How cool is it when you have the Sahili deck with the deck box and the playmats? So cool. So cool. So Ultra Pro allows you to do that. And again, if you haven't heard, all of Ultra Pro's sleeves now... Even the ones with the printed background have that Eclipse technology, so they have a very high durability. You know, the pr professor does the stretch test where you pull, I'm not gonna do it here because I wanna put the card back in it, but it used to be that printed sleeves were not as durable and they would sort of fall apart. But Ultra Pro, when they developed the Eclipse sleeves, they developed a new way to do their sleeves and they just sort of retroactively applied it to their entire line. And so anytime Ultra Pro makes a sleeve now, it has that Eclipse durability, so you can really, feel good that they're going to last for a long time. And the final way to support the show is on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash command zone, you can contribute to us directly. Our patrons are awesome. They get a lot of benefits. One of the biggest ones is being able to see game nights earlier than the rest of the general public. And let me just tell you, the next game nights is going to be Commander 2018 focused. That's right. If you want to see that a day early, go to patreon.com slash command zone and sign up. In fact, we call out one lucky patron every single episode, and this episode is dedicated to Mason Stallcup. Mason, you rock. Okay, let's get into the Sahili Artifact, Blue Red Artifact deck review. A couple of notes really quick here. For the purposes of this episode, we're just going to talk about quick upgrades to the deck. So we're imagining that you're going to your LGS, you're going to cardkingdom.com slash command zone, you're ordering a pre-con, this one, you're grabbing it, you're taking it out of the box. First of all, first of all, first of all, you should play the pre-cons against each other straight out of the box. Oh, they're super fun. It's one you of just my pull them out of the box and then uh, it's a really interesting play experience. You can kind of see where the new cards and everything fits together. Yeah, and a lot of times Wizards designs them in that environment with the pre-cons from the same year sort of going against each other. So they're really balanced for that environment and they're sort of meant to be played that way. And so taking them out with your friends and just playing at least a few rounds before you do any upgrades, I would highly recommend. But then, you know, listen, uh, people are going to want to build highly tuned versions of these things, but that can take time. What we're looking at here and what I like to do is grab the deck and be able to play it, but a, but a better version of it fairly quickly. The pre-cons are cool, don't get me wrong, but I don't want to play with a pre-con, you know, 
six times in a row. You want to be able to sit down against non-precon decks and be able to play a little bit with yep. your precon that's just been upgraded a tiny bit. Right. So in these episodes, we're going to do one for each of the new precons. We are going to be talking about quick upgrades. We're talking 10 to 12 cards. We're going to go over what cards we think should go in. We're going to put up a list of what cards you, we think you should take out. We're going to be budget conscious here. We're not going to mention any cards that are over $25. And most of the cards we'll talk about will be under $5. We're, yeah. we're really aiming this at most people. So you can grab the deck, open it up, quickly make some changes, and up the power level by a lot, and then go out and play it right away. So that's really what the aim of this is. Um, one last note. We're not going to really break down the mana bases most of these could use a mana base, like if you want to go to focus or optimize on our on I our think level. that basically you could go through your binders and say, well, that's a land that matches. That's a land that matches. You don't need us to tell you that. Right. And also, honestly, like most of the precons, the mana base is going to work. It's not going to hold you back too much. So that's not something that's like of dire need of instantly upgrading. There's a lot of basics. And actually, basics are pretty good. Yep. They come into play untapped. So there's not really a lot of work that needs to be done in this specific deck. Okay, so let's read the headliner. She's on the box. She's the Planeswalker. It's Sahili the Gifted. There are actually four new commanders or creatures that can be your commanders in this uh, deck. So Sahili the Gifted is two, a blue, and a red. Four mana total for a four loyalty Planeswalker Sahili. You can plus one and create a 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact creature token. So you can play her on four. She goes to five. You get a 1-1 one, one servo. She has a second plus one ability. It says the next spell you cast this turn cost one uh, generic mana less to cast for each artifact you control as you cast it. For each artifact you control. Right. Wow. So it's a really interesting ability in that if you have five artifacts out, you plus one Sahili. The next spell you cast will cost five less to cast. Wow. Yeah. Now That's a huge reduction. It is a huge reduction. It's kind of, I mean, you could cheat out really big things, right? Yeah. There's an interesting wording that I noticed, which is it says, for each creature you control as you cast it. So in response to you plus wanting this ability, some could someone could destroy a couple of your artifacts, and then when you go to cast the spell. Oh. Yeah, so you got to watch out a little bit for that. It's not going to come up a ton because instant speed mask artifact removal is not super common, but a Cyclonic Rift or something at the wrong time could really... Mess you up. Uh, or what's your favorite underrated card? My favorite underrated card. Two and a blue. Oh, yeah. Rebuild. Rebu <laughs> Rebuild would be really good. I'm like, uh, uh, uh. It uh, would uh. destroy it. Would <laughs> you, you'd be like, I'm about to go off, and I'm going to plus yeah. my Sahili to play this big a rebuild. Yeah, exactly. With that, with that plus on the stack, I'll just rebuild. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. And then she has an ultimate ability, which is really interesting. It's negative seven. It says, for each artifact you control, create a token that's a copy of it. Those tokens gain haste. Exile those tokens at the beginning of the next end step. That's really interesting because the ex I wouldn't expect the exile clause to be on an ultimate from a planeswalker. Yeah, I kind of I think that this ultimate is pretty powerful, just doubling up all the artifacts that you have in an artifact deck. It might not be game winning though, which is what we kind of expect off of Planeswalkers ult ultimates. Yeah, I kind of do like that, um, honestly, because maybe people won't be as keen to like just take out your Sahili as fast as possible because they're they can't let the ultimate ever happen. Depending on what your board looks like, they might be like, "Eh, the ultimate's not as scary," so I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna go nuts like trying to kill her. One great thing for playing Sahili is that the thing I'm scared of most is that middle plus one ability of casting huge things with Sahili. Yeah. And that's really hard to interact with. Very hard. Um, she also does have sort of a writer clause at the end that says, Sahili the Gifted can be your commander, which you would expect since she's on the cover of a Commander <laughs> 2018 product. So that's sort of one of our possible choices. One of the things we like to do in these episodes is look at um, the other commanders in the deck that are a possibility and just kind of say, well, it's not always a given that you'll just play the one that's the oversized card that's on the box. Sometimes you might want to play one of the other commanders. Also gives us a good idea of what other things might be going on in the deck and why certain cards are there and, you know, other decks we might want to build. That's right. So one of the other legendary creatures in the deck is... Thanos, Urza's Apprentice. Ooh, it's Thanos. It's that's Thanos. pretty cool. Is this the first time we've seen Thanos? Thanos as an actual, like, person? Character, yeah. As a character? 
Because rather than just his artifacts lying around. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. But he's got some powerful artifacts, so I'm excited. Okay. Uh, Thanos is a blue and a red for a 1-3 legendary human artificer. Thanos has haste. Okay. okay. So you can attack with that 1-3 immediately. No. It has an activated <laughs> ability. Uh, blue and a red tap. Copy target activated or triggered ability you control from an artifact source. You may choose new targets for the copy. So it kind of rings of bright hearth, an artifact you control. Yeah, rings it of bright say hearth. Does it non mana? No, it just says activated or triggered ability you control I guess from an artifact source. So it has to be from an artifact source, but usually you can't copy the produce mana part. That's why it's a strionic resonator too, because it's activated or triggered. Yeah. Oh. My brain is immediately like I know. putting together the synapses are firing. What if I combine this with this and copy it? So we want artifacts that do powerful things that uh, tap to do some crazy stuff or have great triggered abilities. And this seems like a great toolbox to just make the rest of your artifact deck just double up and really start humming. There's got to be some crazy combos. I mean, already Staff of Domination seems insane with this card. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. It's got haste. I like that it has haste. Yeah. Because <laughs> for two man, you can get everything going, you know, and your commander's just sitting there in the command zone. And then when you have something really important, an tr important trigger or an important activated ability, you cast it and then boom, you're immediately doing what you need to do. Okay, so we've got Sahili who cares about just kind of having a lot of artifacts in general. We've got Thanos who wants your artifacts to have abilities, whether they're triggered or activated. Yeah. Okay, the third... Commander, and usually these decks have three commanders. Um, that's traditionally just been how they built them, which three commanders in the colors. And then sometimes there's like another commander within the deck that's like two of the three colors or one of the two colors. So the, the other um, is it commander is Brutaclad Telcor Engineer. I have no idea if I pronounced any of that correctly, except for Engineer, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's four, a blue, and a red. That's six mana total. For a 4-4, four, four. six mana, that's a lot. Okay, legendary artifact creature, artificer. It says, creature tokens you control have haste. That's interesting. Haste is good. Then it says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a 2-1 blue mirror artifact creature token. Then you may choose a token you control. If you do, each other token you control becomes a copy of that token. So you turn all of your tokens into a copy of one of your tokens and this guy makes a token so you automatic so let's say sahili's out you made a one one. Oh yeah you play brutaclad you you have your phone go off because you're unprofessional and your phone is turned on while we're recording <laughs> hi i'm recording is this important <laughs> oh not for a while i love you very much though i'm going to turn my phone on silent now <laughs> So if you have Sahili out and you plus one or make a servo, then you play Brutaclad. And at the beginning of your combat, he'll create a 2-1. And then after the 2-1's created, you can say, oh, I want all my tokens to make a copy of the 2-1. So at the very least, like your 1-1's one -ones become 2-1's. Like that's not... That's the that's the least. I think I think that we're we're aiming a little bit low here because I think that I mean, there's some tokens. Better, I'm just saying. There's some tokens out there that are pretty powerful. Does it have to be an artifact token? No, it's just any token. It's any token. And it doesn't care the ones that is changing it. I can't pick the card up off the table. It doesn't care the cards that it's changing. That's why you need tokens. a playmat. Yeah. <laughs> a Sahili playmat. It doesn't yeah, it doesn't care what kind of tokens they are at all. The artifact part is totally immaterial. And all of your tokens have haste. Correct. So any token you play, regardless of Right, so that mirror. So even that though this is in like an artifact deck and it creates an artifact, this is kind of a, a is it token general. What I really want to do is just have a bunch of server tokens and turn them all into clues, and just draw a lot <laughs> of cards. Wants That's to draw all, all the I cards. <laughs> okay, so those but, are, but hang on, he's thinking outside the box because right. it's not just any token. Like it can it's change a, it's into not a just clue. A creature token, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it can turn into a token. If you can make a token of something that's a non-creature, you can turn all your tokens Well, and if into you that. can make clues, then you can turn those clues into right. uh, any sort of gigantic so token. Why would you do that? You, the you clues can already, already do, do what you want. You can already draw cards why, yeah, off the clues. Why are you changing? They can't become better that's than true. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're right. <laughs> okay. So those are the three is it commanders that we're going to consider here, but there is one other commander in the deck. Now you can't out of the box, run this as a commander because it's mono red. Yeah. But it's cool. We have Varchild, Betrayer of Keldor. Two and a red for a 3-3 legendary human knight. 
Whenever Varchild, betrayer of Keldor. Why are you saying it is, like that? The, the, how else would you read uh, it? You're right, you're right. How yeah. else would you read it? Uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, that player creates that many 1-1 one, one red survivor creature tokens. Survivors your opponents control can't block and they can't attack you or a planeswalker you control. When Varchild leaves the battlefield, gain control of all survivors. I'm a survivor. I'm not, sorry. That is We that don't do is songs weird. anymore. Jimmy's gone. You're, <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. No, Jimmy will come back and he will just just have so many songs. <laughs> that, was the com- that was in the comments. They're like, they're like Why did I, you miss, guys sing I miss anymore? my songs. Yeah, miss it's funny because when we sing, people are like, stop singing. Um, okay, so Varchild <laughs> swings, hits your opponent, and then however much damage Varchild did, that opponent. That many. That opponent gets that many 1-1 survivors. Yeah, you don't get them. Yet, but the survivors, that gets them. the survivors can't attack you, they and can't they block. can't block, so they can't just throw them away blocking. And and then if Varchild is it leaves the battlefield, yeah. So so you swing at Jimmy, you, he gets three sure. survivors. Then you swing at Mel, she gets three survivors. Then you swing at Craig, he gets three survivors. Then I don't somebody, know why I'm doing that. I'm just going to yeah. keep swinging at Jimmy. He can't block, and then he can use all of his survivors against everyone else. Actually. Either way, so let's There's say so many survivors. Let's say attacking. there's nine survivors out there, and then somebody goes, "Okay, I've had enough of this. I'm gonna swords Varchal." And you go, "Sweet, I get the nine survivors." Yes. I'm confused though. Like there's like from a flavor standpoint. So Varchal is like a raider, and it's going around. It's clearly like raided a town or village. And there, there is a flaming like village behind it. Yeah. Behind. So like it has left the survivors are refugees that have had to flee to like another country. Oh no! no I get it. So then once the warlord is defeated, they go back home. Everyone, yep. Oh. Uh, the flavor. But there also, was a it's kind of cool. There was a Varchild. Yeah, talk about it because I'm going to look. There was another survivor card. That had Do you to- know what I like with this? I want to play Crown of Doom. Okay, I don't even know what that so is. So Crown of Doom is an artifact, and uh, basically it gives all creatures that attack the person that has Crown of Doom plus two plus oh. But you can pay two mana to donate Crown of Doom to someone else. And once you donate the Crown of Doom to one of your opponents, they can never give it back to you. So your opponents all just keep passing around this horrible artifact that allows people to attack them with much greater power. Uh, and you p- then provide everyone else with survivors to go attacking. And plus you want to attack them too because you have exactly. Oh, I like that. I've so you give everyone card. kind of like weird power buffs and you make everyone attack. Maybe you do Tempt with Vengeance and you get some cool elementals with haste, but then you give everyone else an opportunity to get them too. I like this a lot. So the card I was thinking of is Varchild's War Riders. It was one in a red for a three, four, has trample and rampage one, but cumulative upkeep was put a survivor token into play under target opponent's control. Treat this token as a one, one red creature. Would Varchild give, I mean, obviously you'd get them back, but it would, would it make them so they can't attack you or? Survivors, your opponent's control, can't block and they can't attack you or planeswalker you control so varchal doesn't care where the survivors came from just survivors your opponent's control and then you get them because it says when it leaves the battlefield gain control of all survivors (laughs) pretty cool pretty two card combo by the way two mana three four trample rampage (laughs) it's pretty good look at that value right there (laughs) i am I'm going to build this deck. Okay. I'm going to build this deck. I'm you know so you really are becoming Jimmy because that's I the know. mono red one. So oh. we'll get him seeing very soon, everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk about the stats of the deck. Those are the four new commanders. There are some reprint commanders. We won't go over all of them. Um, oh, you, do you know the stats thing? Have you ever done it before? Stats. Stats. You don't go like stats, 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 stats. We could. We could add that to it now that you're here. We'll practice it. Stats. 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 Did I do it right? I don't even know. This is your, this is your thing. There's <laughs> was clearly a lot of stats going your spin on. on. There's it. clearly a lot of stats going on. <laughs> okay. I'm excited. So we do this every time. So, of course, there are four categories where we, we always talk about card draw, ramp, targeted removal, and board wipes. This deck has about seven card draw spells. Um, it's sort of estimated because there's three mana rocks that can draw cards if you sacrifice them, but I wouldn't count Mind Stone as like a card draw spell, right? So uh, I kind of added it up. There are some that draw more than one card, though. Um, then there are 14, 14 um, ramp spells, all artifacts, as you would imagine, but that's a lot. Um, there are five targeted removal spells. A little low, but about right. Sure. 
Five and five for target removal and board wipes is usually what we want. And there are four board wipes. So again, slightly low, but not like criminally low. This is a, These four categories I've noticed they've gotten a lot better at. When we first started doing the show, these numbers were all over the place. And now we're pretty close to the 10, 10, 5, 5 that most decks want. Well, 14 ramp is really good, yeah. especially when you can find ways to utilize those artifacts. Yep. So all, two of the commanders, Sahili and Thanos, care about artifacts specifically. And Sahili cares about them a lot. And so I was wondering how many artifacts are in the deck. And there's 33 artifacts in the deck. Now, we know from the commander deck building template that usually if a deck cares about a thing, like it's an elf deck or merfolk deck, or if it's a not just tribal, if it's a instance and sorceries deck or whatever, you usually want around 30 of that thing at the least. The Shadowborn Apostles deck wants about 30 Shadowborn Apostles. Yeah. That that number is pretty consistent across across decks that care about a thing. So 33 is very good. Plus, there are six non-artifact artifact cards that create artifacts. Um, one of the new ones is Loyal Apprentice. This is, there's an entire loyal cycle. So there's a loyal something for every color. This is the red one. It's one in a red for a two one. It's a human artificer with haste. It's, it has Lieutenant. So Lieutenant- Lieutenant is back. Yeah, Lieutenant's back. Lieutenant's an old mechanic from a commander set that basically says this creature cares about if your commander is on the field with it. Um, and it says at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control your commander, create a one one colorless thopter artifact creature token with flying and that token gains haste until end of turn. So it's a two mana, two one. But if your commander's also out, it makes a Thopter every combat and gives the Thopter haste. And it has haste. A decent card, especially if you want artifacts on the battlefield, it has a chance to sort of give you an artifact every turn. Yeah. Um, then because Tanos cares about artifacts, triggers, and activated abilities, I was curious how many cards in the deck, how many artifacts in the deck sort of had those things that Thanos might interact with. And there was about 14 to 15 um, of these, which is a decent amount. Uh, so it's not going all in on the secondary commander, but there's yeah. enough so that if you have Thanos out, you can do something. Right, exactly. And one of the new ones that I think is pretty cool. Retrofitter Foundry. This one mana artifact has four activated abilities on it. Trading posts, little brother. <laughs> Uh, well, almost like Trading Post, it might be like something else. When the first ability is three generic mana to untap uh, Retrofitter Foundry. That oh, sounds like, like Staff of Domination instead. Oh, so this is go infinite, somehow do something with infinite mana, basically. We're always very wary when something <laughs> says untap this thing. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing is three generic mana untap uh, the Foundry. Then the second ability is two in a tap, create a 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact creature token. Okay. Uh, the next one is one and tap, sacrifice a servo, create a one one colorless thopter artifact creature token with flying. And the last ability is tap, sacrifice a thopter, create a four four colorless construct artifact creature token. So they're kind of like adding to, they take servos in, add wings to it, now it's a thopter. Yeah, that's take right. Take thopters in, add whatever to it, and now it's a, what is it? Construct, four a four construct. construct. They literally they have, they have to rip the wings off again then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe they just add they just add so stuff. much armor to yeah. it it can't fly anymore. <laughs> yeah. He's got little wings on its back <laughs> like trying to fly. And it's like nope, you're not gonna no. fly. Uh, but this seems pretty cool. If you have a bunch of mana to sink into this, you can go infinite because you can untap this. If you have infinite mana, you'll make infinite amount of four fours. Yeah. Now, if you had Brutoclad out, all your tokens would have haste. That's in true. In which case, you would just win at that point. Um, so. That seems pretty good, but also it's just, yeah, it's just a value engine. Like sometimes you create a servo, sometimes you make it into a thopter. I mean, if someone, if you just happen to have a thopter, which we know exists in the format, this can upgrade your thopter into a 4-4. Yeah. Just, yeah, I'm going to have a 4-4. I'm going to upgrade into a 4-4. That seems okay. Might have third of activation too, where you swing in with a thopter. They've got like a, some sort of flyer, but they can't block. Because if you do, you can change it into, is it only any time you can make? Do well, you have to sacrifice it. So. Oh yeah, it, won't, it doesn't change it. Well, into. but basically what you do is you just swing in with a bunch of stuff. Someone's like, well, I'll block that thopter. And you're like, yeah, no, I'll just get a good That one's instead. a 4-4 now. Yeah, or construct instead. Uh, okay. So there's, that's one of the 14 or 15 ways in the deck to sort of, um, synergize with Thanos. Would you consider copying this this ability? I think the four four. See, so the way that it's it's templated, right? You tap sacrifice the Thopter colon, so you don't have to sacrifice another Thopter. So now you can sacrifice one Thopter to make two four fours. 
That with seems Tano's. pretty good. You'd need a red and a blue, obviously, in ta- with Tano. I will play a red and a blue for a for two, four, 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 four cons- construct for sure. If you have the loyal apprentice out, it just makes the Thopter, and then with the retrofitter foundry, turning the Thopter into a four four is zero mana. You just tap the retrofitter foundry. Like that's kind of nuts. This seems like there's a lot of synergy existing between these newer cards that we're seeing here. Almost like they designed the deck that way. Uh, okay, so. Brutoclad obviously cares about tokens in a couple of different ways. And so I was curious how many token makers there were in the deck. And there's about nine. Loyal Apprentice is one of them. Uh, Varchild's one of them. There's a few cards that make tokens. And then Brutoclad's interesting, though, because really you need a way to make big tokens in so order far, to really... The yeah. biggest one we have is a 4-4 four, four so far. Right. And so that's pretty good. Like if I had a bunch of servos from Sahili, a couple of Thopters, and then Brutoclad comes out and I could just make one 4-4, now all my uh, tokens turn into 4-4 constructs. And they have haste. Right. So I was like, okay, so there's nine token makers total, but only about three or four make big tokens. Um, Is four considered a big token? I, I would consider 4-4 four, four big okay. tokens. So there's, so there's four and maybe five. So the four, there's like a, there's a new card again. You can read it. Ooh. Let's look at this. Ancient Stone Idol is 10 mana? It's a lot of mana. But okay, 10 uh, mana. If okay, you but, want a big but, token, but, you can have the base right. mana. And also remember, Sahili makes things cheaper. Right, so this right. could theoretically come out super quickly. Right. Okay, Ancient Stone Idol is 10 mana for a 12-12 artifact creature golem. It has flash. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, this spell costs one generic less to cast for each attacking creature. So you flash it out while attacks are happening. Whoa. Uh, it has trample. And when Ancient Stone Idol dies, create a 612 colorless construct artifact creature token with trample. This is interesting because you can play it with Sahili. For cheaper. For cheaper. But you kind of have to do that at sorcery speed because you want to use this ability. No, no. It's just the next spell you cast. So, so it, you it activate, has to be on your turn. You activate it and you're like, hold on. I'm going to go to attacks yeah. now. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Get a huge discount. Um, also, this has flash, and it's for each attacking creature that's so, not your own attacking creatures. Correct. So, so if your if, opponent attacks you with five creatures, this costs five less to cast. You flash in. Plus, it blocks one and eats one, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And then, if it ever dies, I mean, it is a 12-12 trample, but if it does die, you get a 6-12 left over. So if you have Brutoclad out, now you can turn all of your tokens into 6-12. So that's a lot of hoops to jump through for a, six, for a bunch of 6-12s, but it could happen. But I mean, this, that's true, but this does come out quickly. It does block really well. Uh, It's got trample. And if they board wipe, you still get value out of it. It seems good. Uh, Another one is Sahili's Artistry. So it's four blue, blue for a sorcery. It says, choose one or both. Create a token that's a copy of target artifact. Create a token that's a copy of target creature, except it's an artifact in addition to its other's types. So this could create an art of, uh, uh, sorry, a token that's a copy of a big creature. And Brutoclad could turn all of your tokens into that. Uh, I, I choose both, yeah. by the way. I yeah. choose both. Yeah, I want two Noxious Gear Hulks. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Jimmy thank did that. you. Thank Jimmy you, did that to playing me once. <laughs> Jimmy, did, Jimmy did that to me once. So. I, it's also interesting that you could create a token of an artifact and then have a useful artifact that you could use. Sure, let's like say you create copies like, a, I don't know, like a Gilded Lotus or something. And Oh, my gosh. And then you said, oh, well, I have four servos lying around. Now I've got five Gilded Lotuses. So I just have as much mana as I feel That's like. That's so much yeah. mana. Jeez. Um, I also have a card that creates some awesome tokens. It's called Prototype Portal. This is a reprint. It costs yep. four generic mana for an artifact, and you can imprint. That means that when Prototype Portal enters the battlefield, you may exile an artifact card from your hand. And then you pay X and tap to create a token that's a copy of the exiled card where X is the converted mana cost of that card. So you cast this for four and you unfortunately have to exile an artifact from your hand. Yep. So that artifact is gone. But then you have a cool artifact that pumps out other copies of that exiled artifact. This one is interesting because it's a card that interacts with both Thanos and Brutoclad because Thanos could double the trigger and make two tokens and Brutoclad could turn all of your other tokens into whatever that token is. Or if you made enough tokens with the prototype portal, could turn all those tokens into something else. That's great. Yeah. This is risky though. Like yes. things about this card and Isochron Scepter, yes. you, you always get so worried about imprinting something on it because you want to imprint something good. 
but you're so worried that it's just going to get destroyed before you have a chance to get a lot of value out of it. You almost don't want to play this until you can activate it on the same turn just to sort yeah. of guarantee yourself some value. And then, so the last thing is, Sahili's really interesting in that we've sort of alluded to it, her second ability, the one that says uh, you plus one, and it says the next spell you cast this turn costs one less to cast for each artifact you control as you cast it. <laughs> That's a sort of cheat big spells into play before you could. And if you think about the play pattern in this deck, it's often going to be like Mana Rock, Mana Rock, Sahili, Servo Token, a couple more artifacts. You know, you could easily have on turn five, untapping with Sahili, you know, four or five artifacts on the table, right? Because you're talking about, you have 14 pieces of ramp in this deck. Yeah, and they're all and artifacts. Of, and it's all artifacts. And so, so in you, your scenario, you're using two artifacts to get out Sahili, and then, then the you first, have your mana, your ramp, and Sahili's ability? Right, so the first turn, Jeez. maybe you servo her, then you untap on five, and you say, okay, I'm going to plus her for a second ability, and I've got four artifacts out, so I get four mana, plus I have five, so there's a nine mana spell coming out on turn five. You know, maybe 10, depending on if you got something out like the Thopter Apprentice or That's the Loyal crazy. Apprentice would make two Thopters so that maybe you have five or six. If you think about it in a way like a Soul Ring is a great card. Yeah. But a Soul, and a soul Ring would add two mana. Right. In Sahili's, it adds three mana. Right. That's crazy. So you can have some very explosive like early turns with Sahili where you're cheating something big into play. And so I was looking, what are the big mana spells in the deck? And honestly, there's not a lot. There's only three big mana spells in the deck. That doesn't seem like enough. No, it, it seems very low. So one of them is Mere Battlesphere, which is a classic commander card, goes in a lot of decks. It's a seven mana, four, seven. But when it comes in, you get four, one, one Mere Artifact Creature tokens. Um, and then whenever Mere Battlesphere attacks, you can tap as many of the Mere as you want. Um, and if you do, the Battlesphere gets plus X, plus O until end of turn and deals X damage to the to uh, the player or planeswalker it's attacking. Does it say player and planeswalker on there now? Yeah, because they've retemplated it. That's awesome. Um, so this is a really good card for a lot of reasons. It's a way early on to get value out of Sahili's um, second ability. Also, in a world where there's a lot, where there's more planeswalkers as commanders, and I think we can assume we're going to see, at least for the fir first few months, a lot of people running the Planeswalkers just because there's a novelty to it because you can't normally have a Planeswalker. Because they're so cool. Yeah, exactly. And so Mere Battlesphere gets to just gun down directly the Planeswalker without, you don't care if they block or whatever, you tap your mirror and do damage directly to the Planeswalker. Is that a triggered ability on an artifact? Exactly. So Thanos <laughs> can also do that. Brutoclad makes mirror tokens. So those tokens can be added to the mix as far as tapped to add to what Mere Battlesphere is doing. Very, very good card. Uh, and then the second big spell... But one thing that, that you pointed out, though, oh, is that a second ago, you just described um, Sahili producing nine mana. Right. And one of the big spells that we've used only costs seven. Seven. And there's not a lot that costs more than that. We did talk about the Ancient Stone Idol already. That's true. The third one is not a good card, and I'll talk about it later, but it's Inkwell Leviathan. So... The deck seems deficient in this area, which I think is one of the big things that Sahili brings to the table. Because um, I do, like when we were talking about it earlier, I don't really want to make a, is it a servo that I'm making? I don't really want to make a servo. We don't really judge Planeswalkers on their ultimates. So the only thing I really want to do is plus and reduce the mana cost to something big. Yep. So let's let's recap our stats here really quick. Ramp and card draw, they look pretty good. Card draw a, a, is low. So I guess ramp looks really good. Again, and the ramp leads you to the thing where, well, what am I going to do with all that mana, right? I got 14 pieces of ramp. That's a lot. Card draw is low. Only only uh, six, maybe seven, depending on you know, how you count the rocks. Board wipes and target removal, totally fine. Uh, you know, five and four. You might want a little bit more, but it's it's close enough. So what does all this stats tell us? And I think, as usual, there's not enough support for the backup commander. So Thanos only has 14 or 15 cards that synergize with him. That's just not enough of the deck. Brutoclad has 9 or 10 cards that synergize with him. Not enough of the deck. So you're almost forced into playing Sahili as the lead singer of the deck uh, because she just cares about raw number of artifacts. The deck has 33 artifacts plus 6 cards that make artifacts. So 39 artifacts de facto. But her text box is kind of schizophrenic, right? You've got make a servo token. She's a she's a token maker, but there's not like a bunch of ways to do anything about that except for Brutoclad. There's not there's literally no other way to take advantage of pumping a bunch of tokens or anything. You can't like cash them in for damage or mana or anything. No, like that? there's there's okay. no, there's no astronauts altars and things like that. So 
that it, and then her her second ability, which seems to be what the deck's going to do, get a bunch of artifacts out. There's not a good way to cash that in. It's like, am I supposed to go with the token theme or cheap big st- stuff out? If there was more card draw, you could theoretically play two cards in a single turn. Like you step right. it up, like you get your nine man in your scenario and you play a four drop and a five drop. And then right. suddenly you're committing more to the board. But that is unsustainable if there isn't enough card draw. And she, her, if her plus ability said all your spells or something were minus the amount of mana for the amount, but it's only the Ooh. next spell you play, yeah. it would be way broken. But yeah. okay. So let's look, let's look, let's delve a little further into the, into the deck before we decide what cards we want to add and why. So we like to talk about the best cards that come in the deck. And this is a new one and it's really, really sweet. I get to read the, the new sweet one. This does work pretty well with Sahili's ability. Well, uh, better depending. It's named after her. It's yeah. Sahili's directive. X red 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 for a sorcery. Now this has improvise, which means that we can reduce the casting cost of this. You can basically tap your artifacts to pay for the mana. Now a lot of your artifacts are rocks, but servo tokens aren't. Exactly. You can tap them to reduce it by one. So you still have to pay the red red red, but you can tap a bunch of artifacts and put a lot of of mana into X. into X. Yeah. <clears throat> reveal the top X cards of your library. You may put any number of artifact cards with converted mana cost X or less from among them onto the battlefield. Then put all cards revealed this way that weren't put onto the battlefield into your graveyard. This is amazing. This is an insane card. And think about the scenario I laid out earlier where maybe you've got two Thopters, a Servo token, a couple of rocks. You plus the Healy. Your next spell is going to cost five less. You tap all those things to improvise. That's five more mana, plus your mana from the rocks. Maybe you, on turn six or so, you're activating this where X is equal to like 13. And then you're going to That's crazy. look at the top 13 cards. And, and then put, it's a Genesis wave for artifacts. Yeah. And you could but do, it's easy to cast because it has improvise on it. And you could do it really early because of Sahili. It is narrower because it only hits artifacts. But I also think one thing that's really good is that it sends a lot of the stuff that you don't use into your graveyard. Yeah. Your graveyard can be a huge resource. Yeah, so this card is crazy in a deck that has 35 artifacts or so, which is basically what this deck has. I think it's most decks that run Genesis Wave, well, obviously it hits all permanents, so yeah. it's different. But I, th- I think Sahili specifically works so well with this because what she's doing is just creating a bunch of mana to be used somehow. And Sahili's Directive will use up exactly the amount of mana you've got. So... A really good card. A card that goes well with it is Blink Moth Urn. It's five mana for an artifact. This is another one of the best cards in the deck. It says at the beginning of each player's pre-combat main phase, if Blink Moth Urn is untapped, that player adds uh, colorless or diamond mana for each artifact they control. So this is a symmetrical effect. Yes. So if my opponents have artifacts, they will get mana off of this. I'm just assuming that your your opponents do not have 35 artifacts in your deck <laughs> and, and stuff that creates token artifacts and things like that. Totally. As their We're going to get so much mana off of this. They thing. might get two and you're going to get seven. And I like that exchange. Yeah, definitely. So this is another way to sort of... But again, this is on the same plan, right? Create a bunch of mana. What am I doing with it? Let's talk about the worst cards in the deck, cards that we're definitely going to take out, why I think they're bad. This is just bad in relation to this deck. I don't, I mean, I think these cards don't have homes in other decks, but I would take them out of this deck. Uh, the first one, I think we both saw it and we thought it was interesting, but we didn't like it. Coveted Jewel is six mana for an artifact, and when Coveted Jewel enters the battlefield, draw three cards. Wait, you don't like this? You draw why three cards. Why would you like that? When it enters the battlefield, there's more text. But you draw three cards when it enters the battlefield. Okay. Then you can tap it to add three mana of any one color. It just keeps getting better. Why the heck don't we like this card? There's one more line of text. Here we go. (laughs) Whenever one or more creatures an opponent controls attack you and aren't blocked, that player draws three cards and gains control of Coveted Jewel. Untap it. This is Romancing the Stone on a card here. Jewel of the Nile. (laughs) Oh my gosh. There is so much risk reward on this. If no one ever attacks you and is unblocked... You get to draw three cards and have a But you don't rock? get to draw three cards every turn or anything. So Well, you can yeah. give it to them and then take it back again once you attack that's them. That's what you, you... I mean, you need to make those deals, but everyone else at the table is not going to abide by the deal, right? Whoever's got the no. jewel, they're coming after you. And that's why I don't like the card because you don't want to encourage the entire table to start attacking you. It's super... It's... It's too risky. Yeah. It's, and it also, I think that you make a good point that it doesn't really fit in this deck. It's yes. not that it's a bad card because you could theoretically 
do use this as a really good card. What about something like uh, Brago blinking it and you keep drawing yeah. three cards every single turn yeah. and it's the mana rock Brago likes to be able to untap. Yep, Edric, a deck that's for sure got a lot of unblockable and a lot of creatures that are coming in and so you can always steal it back. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that that's, those are the type of decks. This deck, I know why because it's, it's a, it's got a token sub theme. And so the idea is like, I have enough creatures that maybe you've got three creatures. I've got four, I attack with four and one goes through and blocks and I get this backdrop. Like, yeah, cards. I have an easy way to get damage yeah. through and then I can always block because it's not that they have to attack you. They have to just be unblocked. Yeah. So as long as you block them, you're fine. But I still don't like it because in that scenario, like here we go, now everyone needs to attack me. This is just causing, I don't, just don't like encouraging people to attack me. So it's really, it's really high risk and I think that it's a fun card, but in pre-cons, you might not want to incur all of that risk. Yeah. Okay. Um, another card that I think it's a new card, but I think it's got to come out is Enchanter's Bane. Now, I like the design on this, and I think it opens up some pops possibilities. If they go down this path some more, this card itself is kind of a miss. It's one in a red for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, target enchantment deals damage equal to its converted mana cost to its controller unless that player sacrifices it. So you pick the target enchantment at your end step, and then it, it blasts them for the CMC. Okay. I, I mean, red wants to deal damage. It's kind of incidental damage. It's, this is a red way to sort of interact with the artifacts a little bit. Enchantments a little bit. Oh, sorry, enchantments. Yeah, a little bit. Because what other way does red have to deal? Chaos, Chaos warp. warp. Yeah. Yeah. And then colorless stuff. Here's the thing. It's not a May ability, first of all. So if you play this on two, it's likely to be the only enchantment out, in which case you have to, I believe, choose your stealth. You just take two every turn if no yeah. one else has any or enchantments. Or sacrifice this. Or seems sacrifice like a it. Oh, that seems real bad. But what if Red had an enchantment that said at your end step or at each end step or something, uh, you know, at each player's end step, each enchantment that player controls deals damage equal to its CMC to them? There, that, that would be a good... Right now, this is this is interesting because, like you said, this is an area that they're exploring and they're going to see how it's played. But that card uh, itself is a dud. Let us know if you plan on playing this card in Neheb. a specific situation or something like that. But this is at the end oh, of your turn, end right? Step. Yeah, it's yeah. your end step. No, it doesn't work that great for me. But I mean, there are a lot of enchantments that go unpunished from red decks. Zendikar Resurgent. So yeah. Zendikar oh, yeah. Resurgent costs seven. seven mana. Yeah. So it's like get rid of your awesome card or take seven damage every single turn. If Zendikar Resurgent said on your ins or take seven damage every turn, no, I'd still play it. I think I'd still play it. It's still really good. Uh, but yes, it would be a little bit of a downside. Uh, and the last card is one we talked about. Oh, sorry, we're in the, still in the worst cards in the deck category. Is one we talked about. It's one of the big mana cards. It's Inkwell Leviathan. It's seven blue blue for an artifact creature Leviathan. It's a seven eleven with Trample and Island Walk and Shroud. That's it. It's like, I'm going to cheat something out really early and it's going to hit you for seven. Do you know what makes me, puts me off of this and makes me the saddest is that I can't see Healy's artistry it. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean? So, oh yeah. The yeah. Shroud. shroud. Yeah. So I can't make it into a token and then make all my things a token of that. You could imprint it though on prototype portal. <laughs> <laughs> but then you got to pay nine. We're going, we're man, going deep. Then you got to pay nine mana to activate we're your prototype deep. portal. So, okay. So let's take stock here. We are, oh, sorry. I skipped a section. Notable reprints. Um, this, there, there are sort of two, one and a half, I guess. One's decent. It's Unwinding Clock. It's four mana. Oh, I like that. It was like, it kissed the table <laughs> as it went off. It's Unwinding Clock is four mana for an artifact. Untap all artifacts you control during each other player's untap step. This was getting seven, eight bucks. It's not a super expensive one. It's a but good card too, yeah. because it's like a seedborn muse for your artifacts. artifacts That's yeah. great. This would go in a Tano's deck for sure. Sahili's going to take advantage of it less, but there's still some stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> and then Duplicant, uh, not a super expensive card, worth a couple of bucks. It's one we talked about um, on the episode with Gyrus. Where it's a great card, card too. Like this goes yeah. in a lot of decks. So when you pick up this deck and you start tinkering it or breaking it apart, uh, duplicate goes in a lot of different places. Yep. So those are kind of the two that we see. Now we're not finance people, so I would encourage you. And and at the time we're recording this, the deck lists aren't available to the public, so can't really like go online and put in the whole deck list and check. So a and site they shift so much the yeah. prices because as well, soon as they're announced then basically you pull all the numbers yeah. and they all kind of And adjust. they all start to, to drop. But I think the number when it comes out is what's important. Like you're getting a high value card, even if the reprinting of that card kind of drops the price, the, the value of that card 
to you is still sort of what it was before because they could have not reprinted it, right? Yeah. Um, so I would encourage you to go to my maybe like MTG Goldfish or something. They usually put the entire deck up and the price of each card in it so you can kind of see what the the value in it is. But as far as I can tell, that was it. Unwinding Clock is kind of the, the biggest one in the deck. All right. So let's look at this thing out of the box. The biggest thing I notice about the deck is just kind of like it's there's a lack of ways to win the game. There's a bunch of token makers. There's really only one token maker that pumps all the tokens. It's Brutoclad, and you also have to jump through an additional hoop. It's not like it says pump all your tokens. You have to make a big token and then make all your tokens in that token to pump all of them. That's another hoop. Um, you can create a bunch of mana with Sahili's second ability, but there aren't a lot of ways to take advantage of having a bunch of mana. I think there's sort of two strategies you could aim for without a complete overhaul of the deck. One is tokens. And so you could lean into the token thing, add in some stuff that pumps all the tokens, mm. more token makers, take out some of the big mana stuff, and go for a token strategy. And that will lower down a little bit closer to the ground, and yeah. you can be a little bit more of an aggressive Thopter type deck. I wanted an Is It Thopter commander, there you go. and this could be sort of that kind of deck. There could be a shelf for that in there. Um, the other way, and I believe the correct way to go, is the direction of big spells and cheating things into play with Sahili's second ability. And, and mostly because there's already so much ramp. And I really do think Sahili needs to be your lead singer, as it were, just because there's not a lot of support. It requires more than changing 10 cards to make the other two generals work. Remember, we have 14 cards that are artifact ramp. Yeah. We have cards that we identify as one of the better cards, like Blink Moth Urn, in the deck, and all of those, and a commander, that all lead us down a path of, well, let's play something big and awesome. And also, in decks that are going after this goal, which is like, Create a bunch of mana, cast something large. You don't need a ton of the large thing, right? You don't put 20 things that cost 10 <laughs> mana in your deck. You put five or six, because you really just need to get one of those things at the right moment. You don't ever want to have three of them stranded in your hand. And so those changes are actually smaller, and especially since the deck is already leaning that way, has tons of ramp, has Sahili's second mm -hmm. ability. So I believe that's the best way to make this deck good and you know more competitive quickly. Um, so here we go. This, we're going to talk about the 10 cards that we would put in. And then we're not going to list all the cards we would take out, but we are going to put that in the show notes. So if you're interested in exactly what 10 we would take out, it's obviously going to be the worst cards we talked about earlier and then a few others. So, oh, yeah. And um, any of these decks, this is going to be true. This one has blue in it. Yeah. Add Cyclonic Rift. We're not going to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> So let's talk about some general synergy cards, first of all, that I think are just too strong, regardless of the strategy, to, to, to not include. The first one is Duretti Scrap Savant. It's three and a red for a three mana Planeswalker. It says plus two, discard up to two cards, then draw that many cards. Just great all by itself. Negative two, sacrifice an artifact if you do return target card, uh, sorry, target artifact card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So kind of like tinker something out of your graveyard. And that works with some of the big stuff that we have too. If we have a mirror battle sphere or a duplicate or any of this big stuff in our graveyard, then we can get it back on the battlefield What by sacrificing a servo. Yeah, that seems or a doctor. Great. Or, yeah, exactly. And then the negative 10 is an ultimate, which doesn't matter, but I'll read it. You get an emblem with whenever an artifact is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, return that card to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. Josh, it's amazing. We should focus. No, it's it's too far. It's too hard to get to. Yes. Yeah, because because Duretti does enough good stuff just with its uh, plus and minus. And so the next card, General Synergy, is the Scrap Trawler. This card, if you're making an artifact deck, this card has to be in it. Ooh, Scrap Trawler is three generic mana for a 3-2 artifact creature construct. Whenever Scrap Trawler or another artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, return it to your hand, return to your hand target artifact card Card in your graveyard with lesser converted mana cost. So this is just turns all of your artifacts. Like it's not just scrap trawler that does this. It gives your artifact that costs six, like duplicate. When it dies, you get a five drop or less artifact back to your hand. And you've also identified some artifacts mana ramp in here that you can change in for card draw. So you have the ability to get some artifacts straight into your graveyard and get them back again with cards like scrap trawler or cards like Duretti. That's a really good point. Is if somebody casts something that's going to kill one of your creatures or, or one of your artifact creatures, you could sacrifice Mindstone real quick just to have that to get back to your hand, draw a card, get some card advantage out of it. Scrap Trawler is a very, very powerful card. Okay, let's talk about the fun stuff here. 
These are the big <laughs> spells, the big spells we want to add. And I tried to keep these on the from a budget perspective on the reasonable side. You know, we could talk about New Lamog and Emrakul and stuff like that. Uh, which if you have those, you should add them. But for most people, I think these cards are going to do the job. Mm -hmm. So the first one I have is Void Winner. It's mean, Josh. It's nine mana for an 11-9 Eldrazi. It says your opponents can't cast spells with even converted mana costs. Zero is even, by the way. And your opponents can't block with creatures with even converted mana costs. This usually turns off... I will be honest. I think actually even falls a little over 50%. Um, there just tends to be more two drops than one drops. Mm -hmm. So it turns off like 60% of your opponent's hands generally. It's a lot of board powerful. wipes are four. Yeah. So it turns off board wipes a lot of times. Uh, this is a card that if you cheat out early will really cramp down on their options. What was that amount of mana that we hypothetically generated nine or 10. with the Sahili? Yeah, we generated nine mana hypothetically Pretty with the Sahili. So a Void Winner coming down that early crazy if you turn five void winner i like your chances in that game you're just going to cramp your opponent's ability to deal with the void winner itself and it's so huge at that point that it's hard to deal with so i like that man um, here's one that i think you suggested oh i like this this, card, this card is criminally uh cheap it's it's not it's not like 50 cents or it's anything under but it's $5? under five bucks yeah. and this card's ridiculous it's great it's it's it that betrays this 12 mana eldrazi in, is an 11 11 with annihilator 2 Remember, Annihilator is when you attack an opponent. They have to sacrifice, in this case, because it's Annihilator 2, two permanents. Uh, and there's a little bit extra on it that betrays. It matters a lot. <laughs> Whenever an opponent sacrifices a non-token permanent, put that card onto the battlefield under your control. So an early hit that betrays will often win the game because what happens is people don't have a lot of stuff at that point. So if it's turn, say, six or so, which I think is totally possible for this deck... It that betrays is attacking maybe on seven. At that point, they're going to sacrifice like mana rocks, maybe lands. Maybe they have a creature um, or two. You get those things. If you attack again, oh my gosh. it's almost impossible for you to lose. It's you're going to get some lands. You're Yeah, you're just going to be so far ahead because you get the stuff they sacrifice to an Annihilator. Do you know what else is great too? I just love uh, when someone cracks a fetch line and you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. Line. That's mine. They're like, it doesn't even go in your colors. Like, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Someone <laughs> might play an Urborg later. I'm taking it. <laughs> uh, another one is another Eldrazi. It's Kozilek the Great Distortion. Now, this is the one from Oath of the Gatewatch again. Not as expensive as I would think. It's eight diamond diamond. So eight and two colorless mana. There is a lot of mana ramp in this deck that is colorless. So you could cast this card, which I think you have to be able to cast it to put in your deck. You can't just cheat it out with Sahili. Doesn't even create colorless. Yeah, it just reduces the right. generic mana. It doesn't but uh, it's not, affect the colorless. It's not difficult, I think, to get a couple of colorless. So it's a, um, sorry, eight diamond diamond for a 12-12 Eldrazi. It says, when you cast Kozilek the Great Distortion... If you have fewer than seven cards in hand, draw cards equal to the difference. So Our, like draw four? Yeah. Jeez. Four, yeah. Okay. Maybe more. <laughs> uh, Menace. 12-12 with Menace. It matters. And then it says, discard a card with converted mana cost X. Counter target spell with converted mana cost X. It turns all of your spells in hand, by the way, you just drew up to seven, into counter spells of equal converted mana cost. It's That's nuts. crazy. Yeah, it kind of counterbalances everything in your hand. I oh guess. my gosh, it's awesome. We have graveyard synergies we're talking about too. Like that, that is amazing. Uh, I'm just going to talk about you know we've been talking about Eldrazi's these twelve twelves. I'm going to talk about just a really simple zero zero, just real real under. I like this one <laughs> and the next one because you're trying to predict how much mana Sahili is going to make available to you. Having cards like this and they have X in their casting cost means I just get to use all of it no matter how much that is. Yeah, this card is Walking Ballista. XX for a 0, zero artifact creature construct. Walking Ballista enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. You can pay four to put a plus one plus one counter on Walking Ballista. Remove a plus one plus one counter from Walking Ballista. It deals one damage to target creature or player. Uh, this goes really well with your artifacts and unwinding clock that you can just keep pumping mana into Walking Ballista. And honestly... We have the ability to generate a ton of man in the late game. We could just make a huge walking ballista, and that's a threat. It really is. You've I've seen it, walk ballistas end the game not just combo we just by because they're a ten ten, and you can just literally like I shoot seven of them at you. Good night. Great. Yeah. Great. Uh, the next one's even better because it synergizes 
in a couple of different ways. So it's hanger back walker. Again, it costs XX and enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. So four mana makes a two, two, six mana, three, three, ten mana, five, five. When hanger back walker dies, you create a one, one colorless thopter for each one, one counter on it. Oh my gosh. So if you may, if, if, if Sahili gives you like nine extra mana and you're able to pump another nine of this, it could be a nine, nine that when it dies, will create nine thopters that Sahili interacts with. And counts as artifacts that are on the battlefield. And then you can pay one and tap the hanger back walker to put a 1-1 counter on it. So it kind of grows a lot faster than the uh, walking ballista as well. Um, That's and, great. And again, it can just be a big threat that you're bashing in with too. And they want to kill it. And when they do, you you still have a bunch of cool stuff. I like how both of these also are really powerful at any point in the game. Because you can play this for just six mana like yeah. that's what you got and then you got this awesome walking ballista or this awesome hangerback walker that you can just keep using excess mana pumping things into and you might end up having a lot of mana yeah it's like i said you don't want a bunch of void winners in your deck because if you ever f find yourself in a position where you've got three in your hand it's the worst because you you're, you can never cast that amount of stuff they kill your sahili twice and suddenly you're crimped in mana in two ways yeah. so yeah. it's great when your win some of your win conditions walking ballista hanging back walker stuff like that is versatile enough to play in a position where it's not winning the game it's just stabilizing you or helping you continue to like keep up in the game uh the last category because we're very low on card draw i wanted some card draw spells that interact in the correct way with the deck the first one or two you could you could add either or or both is Stroke of Genius and Brain Geyser. I like Stroke of Genius better. It interacts better with Sahili because it's a blue and two colorless. Is that correct? X, two blue. Yeah, and X. So only one colored mana is required in there. Mm -hmm. And it's an instant. And it says draw X spell or X cards. So if you plus Sahili for her second ability and you have, say, five artifacts on the table, that's going to be five more cards you're drawing with Stroke of Genius, right? So, and again, we said, I like X spells because they will take advantage of however much mana Sahili's gonna create. Totally. If it's if it just happens to be a crazy game where you're getting 14, you're gonna you're gonna draw 14 cards. Like, Jeez. Yeah, so I, I really like that. Brain Geyser is blue, blue, and X. Target player draws X cards. Almost as good, but it's not instant. Um, but Sahili doesn't care as much because it says the next spell you cast... Yeah, you're going to be activating it on your turn. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's the next spell you cast this turn for Sahili. Yeah. So you can't even like plus her and then wait for somebody else's turn. Yeah. That would be really cool if they would have just said next spell you cast. <laughs> <laughs> but still. So you, <laughs> the next spell you cast and then you like tick up Sahili. You wait a whole turn and then you tick up Sahili again. again. <laughs> Jeez. I'm, nine, I'm minus 22 on my next spell, guys. Jeez. <laughs> uh, another card that lets you draw is a new one from M19. It's Psy Master Thopterus. Uh, two and a blue for a 1-4 legendary human artificer. And whenever you cast an artifact spell, lots of artifact spells, uh, create a 1-1 one, one colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. One and a blue, sacrifice two artifacts to draw a card. So this automatically ups our artifact count without us doing anything. We have this on the battlefield, we play a few artifacts, and we just randomly end up with a few Thopters. That seems great. Yeah, I think it's great. And it synergizes in a couple of ways. You do want Thopters. You want more artifacts on the battlefield and it's card draw as well. So I think it's a pretty clear include. And the last one is Joyra, Weatherlight Captain. That's the new Joyra from Dominaria. She is two, a blue and a red. And she says that whenever you cast a historic spell, you can draw a card and historic spell includes artifact. It's also legendary uh, permanence and sagas. So if you cast her before Sahili, I don't know why you would, but if you did, then when you cast Sahili, you get to draw a card. So it's not even just the artifacts. Or if you cast Psy Master Thopterist, which is a legendary creature. Then there you, you draw. Go. Yeah. So that's the uh, those are the 10 that we put in. Again, I'll run them down. Duretti, Scrap Trawler, Void Winner, It That Betrays, Kozilek, Walking Ballista, Hanger Back Walker, Stroke of Genius, Andor Brain Geyser, Joira, and Psy Master Thopterist. Josh, that's a good list. Yeah, I like I that list. I think it gives the deck a plan and the ability to win. Um one thing I wanted to talk about really quick is that Sahili's ultimate. So you'll notice we didn't mention it a lot. For one, I think ultimates are going to be very hard to get to. I have played with all of these decks a couple of times in this environment. And I'll tell you that keeping track of which uh, Planeswalker can ultimate is something the entire table will do and will work together to make sure that nobody ultimates. So it's actually very hard to ultimate in the in when you're playing all four against each other. I haven't played them outside of that. 
Um, also, Sahili's ultimate is surprisingly fair. It's a weird ultimate. Usually ultimates win you the game in some way or are so powerful on their own. Sahili requires a lot from you. You have to have a good board presence when it happens. You have to have a lot of artifacts on the battlefield and you only get the tokens until end of turn. Yeah, I'm thinking about a lot of our artifacts. We're talking about a bunch of them in mana rocks. Doubling up your mana rocks is fine. Fine, but not great. Um, we're talking about a lot of utility creatures like uh, Thopters. duplicant. Thopters. Fine. A dupl doubling up a duplicate is fine. Doubling up a mere battle spheres is pretty solid. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the cards that we really cared about... I don't know, like those those cards that you added. If we double up a Hangerback Walker, it'll we, just die. If we double up a Walking Ballista, just dies. We don't get to double up those great Aldrazi that we were talking about. Yep. So a lot of the cards that we think are like really great includes and match with the deck, they won't interact with the ultimate. It's underwhelming. It, the ultimate is very much win more. I think there are times where you're going to activate it. It's going to be great, but there's definitely going to be times where you could activate it. You just have enough loyalty, but you're like it doesn't do that much. I basically make three more mana rocks and two thopters in a servo. And then she dies. Like why I'd rather just create more mana. With keep her that second. high loyalty yeah. so that you can keep plussing and casting more things. Yeah. So I it's, agree. It's an interesting thing. Okay. Uh, once again, we're not going to talk about all the cards we're going to, we would take out in place of those cards, but they will be in the show notes. So check down there to the listeners. What do you think about the Sahili deck? Do we, is there any cards that you think are must includes that we've totally missed on? Uh, this card is this deck is so cool and is it artifacts is such an awesome like thing that we can dive into. I guarantee that there are a ton of cards that people are going to be super excited about playing. And I definitely think there are a lot of builds for this commander that you, a couple of different directions you can go and it doesn't have to be this one. I just think this one is a good way like right away to be able to just upgrade oh, yeah. it and get in there, get in the mix, play against real decks and have a chance and you know get a feel for how this deck works. If you describe upping the power level, like we want to take this out of the box, up the power level so it's competitive, uh, you did that with these cards, with these inclusions. All right. If you want to pick up any of these cards or this pre-con deck, you can go right now to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. If you use that affiliate link when you order all of this stuff, you are making sure that the Command Zone podcast continues to come out each week, that game nights continues to happen. We really do appreciate everybody that supports us in that way. And while you're there, I mean, if you're buying the Sahili deck, you should probably get the Sahili deck box, the Sahili sleeves, Sahili playmat. They really are sweet. Ultra Pro makes the best in the business. They're the only ones I would trust or go to for that type of stuff. They also make awesome dice. They have relic tokens. They have so much cool stuff. So check out Ultra Pro products. Uh, while you're at cardkingdom.com slash command zone or at your LGS all around the world, anywhere, Ultra Pro stuff is the best. Okay. Now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. DJ, you've said the last few times. I got times. you. Yeah, okay. I got you, Josh. Okay, I got okay. you. Jeez. So, uh, so first thing, a question for you. Okay. Um, did you watch the World Cup? Did you watch any of that? Are oh, yeah. You, are I you a sports guy? I'm a sports guy, yeah. Um, I like sports. I didn't watch as much of the World Cup as I would have liked, but I, I definitely saw like the finals and I saw you know some some of the games for sure. Okay. What did you, did you think it was? Did you enjoy it? Like, was it a good? Yeah, I had a lot of fun. There was a okay. couple of games that were crazy. Uh, I, we live in Los Angeles, and when Mexico made it out of the uh, out of the <laughs> Swiss rounds, yeah, there was a literal earthquake. <laughs> it was pretty. There great. was because because they went that crazy. Everyone was like super happy and like, like registered on the Richter like, scale. Like, all my friends were like, "Ah, so it was great." Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm like a. A little bit of a, of a fan, but what I'm a real fan of is I'm actually wearing a shirt right now. I'm a rugby fan. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I played rugby for like eight years. Oh, wow. I even coached rugby for several years afterwards. I had no idea. Yeah. You're a tougher dude than you look then. Yeah. Well, I, I that was a while ago when I played rugby. But it that was, sport it was is hardcore. Super, it was fun. And guess what? It is in the Olympics this year. Yeah. Rugby I, sevens. And it's going to be popular and people are going to like it. And it's going to be great. And rugby is going to be a thing. I don't... Can I ask you a question about it? Of course, about the rules yeah. of rugby? Yeah. Like there's that time when like they kind of like everybody kind of gets like shoulder a scrum. To shoulder. Yeah. How's that? What's the rule? Like why does that happen and how does it work? A scrum it takes place after some sort of infraction. And oh, so it's a penalty. It's like a penalty kick. It's exactly. Okay. Basically, there's no there's no downtime. The ball continue. It's continuous play, and there's only some sort of stoppage if the ball goes out of bounds or if there's some sort of infraction. Uh, the most common one is you pass the ball forward or you drop the ball, and then you have a scrum. And so literally, you get all of the forwards, all of the biggest guys, and they come together and they just crash into each other. And then 
there's a huge advantage to the player, the team that puts the ball in. So they put the ball in the middle and literally the hooker is the person that hooks the ball back. Uh, and it's, it's their job to like kick it back exactly, to, their team. to just go whoosh and mm-hmm. push the ball back. And everyone is trained to lift their feet and push the ball back. And sometimes it's a strategic point where you basically, you hold the ball in the scrum and you just run over the other team. Yeah, Cause I've seen those ones strong where they, enough. Don't, they don't get away. They just kind of remain in contact. Exactly. And then, and then basically there's a point in time that's really critical that you can, move the ball out. And as soon as the ball moves out, then suddenly it's live again. And there's all sorts of different rules. People can peel off and start going for those tackles and start setting stuff up. So it's kind of a lot. It's a set piece. That's a launching off point to sort of have open play start again. Okay, cool. Now I understand rugby a little bit more. Can I ask you one more question? Of course. Do you know the Hakka? Do I know the Hakka? No. Cause that's, that's a big thing in rugby. The Maori who are like my distant cousins cause I'm part Hawaiian. And they're uh, awesome. They're the All Blacks is the New Zealand national team. They're awesome. And they do. They started this thing a long time ago now. So, so a lot of rugby teams do it, where it's the haka, which is a Polynesian like warrior dance. It's awesome. It's you sweet. should you should look it up on YouTube after after this. So you just look up the haka. Craig, put the haka up. Uh, yeah. Oh right my now. gosh. Yeah. It's uh, crazy. It's, it's crazy. Awesome. Um, but like our team was like I had a lot of people that were like. British on my team and stuff like that. And so that it would be not very <laughs> genuine if we were all, we were all doing the Hakka, <laughs> but let's say I was playing on like a team that had a lot of Pacific Islanders, yeah. then, then that might be it. something that I would do. Anyways, rugby's going to be a thing. Enjoy it. That's my, I'll that's my, th- that's my I, thing that I enjoy. I can watch it with you and you can explain it as we go a little bit. Oh yeah. I could okay. literally talk you through, I could talk you through the basics and then talk you through the strategy if you actually care about it from there on out. Sweet. You know, somebody who can talk you through the basics of the modern format and the strategy of the modern format is Alex Kessler and Ben Bateman. They're our sister podcast, The Masters of Modern. You can find them right next to us at collected.company. You can follow them on Twitter at the MMCast. They've started doing video podcasts now. So if you type Masters of Modern into the search bar on YouTube, you will find the masters of modern it would be funny if you found something different i guess uh (laughs) so please check them out and while you're there in that same search bar type in jumbo commander you will find dj's channel where he does tons of deck techs and other other videos we talked about the iconic masters ones you did recently so totally most recently uh i don't know when this is coming out but my most recent video i literally do a walkthrough of all 35 of my commander decks Oh yeah, yeah, I've seen that one. Actually. Yeah, so it's I'm updating awesome. it. It was like that was oh, last year. I'm doing a new one where it's like, all right, a lot of things have changed. Let's do it again. So I'm going to walk through all of my commander decks awesome. really quickly, just like. Bam, bam, You're bam. also doing a Gyrus Waker of Corpses, which was the preview card for the Command Zone that we uh, that episode just came out. So there are going to be so many deck techs coming out. I don't know how I'm going to handle it, but it's going to happen. So go to Jumbo Commander and hit that subscribe button so you know when each and every video comes out. All right. Our editor all is right. Craig Blanchett. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Craig. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer. Look at that. Look at this behind us. Cabal Stronghold. Have Jeffrey. you been have you have you been looking at our wonderful faces or literally looking past thing. us at this amazing <laughs> thing? Oh my gosh. Jeffrey's Jeffrey good. Palmer, you're <laughs> awesome. And at Living Cards MTG. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Uh, we'll be back sooner than expected because Commander 2018, this is the time of the year where we're the most excited. So we're going to do some extra content, extra coverage of all of this stuff. We'll see you again very soon. Thanks for listening. Bye, guys. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>